in this series called Who Am I? We're talking about what our identity in Christ is. Who does God say that you are? And so we've been talking about uh, these very important theological uh, aspects about your life, about who you are in Christ. What is it that God says about you? And so this is not one of those things where it's like, hey, we're going to get a, a good self-help uh, talk, a little pat on the back. No, this is rock solid what the Bible says and what God says about you. And what it does in turn is it changes the way that you behave. It changes the way that you think. So uh, today we're going to talk about this subject, I am successful. I am successful. Now, once again, this is not, I'm not trying to get you to buy a book or listen to a podcast or leave here with a warm fuzzies. Now, if you do, that's great, all right? But that's not the purpose. God says that you are successful when you are in Christ. And I'm going to explain that to you. And let's go all the way back to what success really is. You remember in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, God created everything. He created Adam and Eve in his image. And here's what he said to them. He said, I want you to be fruitful. One of the first things he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And then he said, you're to subdue it and you're to reign over it. Now, this all is the image of God thing. This was before the fall. This is what God has called us to do. And so it is a part of God's image in you that you desire to be successful. And we all desire success, right? I mean, nobody says, hey, I'm going to be a total failure today. I mean, even on the little bitty things in our life, we are geared toward being successful. We want to check off our list. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to work today. That's a successful thing. I'm going to complete this project today. That's a success. That's a, an aspect of success. Uh, I'm going to finish my degree. I'm going to get this job. I'm going to start this business. I'm going to begin to exercise. I want to be a good parent. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. Whatever it is, God has put in us this desire to be successful. Now, here's the problem. Because of our sin nature, because of the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the fact is we can get that out of whack, out of balance. And it can lead to one of two things. It can lead to the desire to be successful in something that doesn't matter. We put all of our eggs in that basket. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's buying a, a boat. Maybe it's getting a certain kind of car. And you put all of your energy, all of your living into that one thing and that job. Getting that money, getting that house, getting that car. Well, it's kind of like you heard the guy say that he spent years climbing the ladder of success to find out that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. And so because of sin, we can get that, uh, that wrong kind of success. Once again, I'm not suggesting that it's wrong to be successful in your job. You should be successful. God has called you to be successful. He's called you to work. He's called you to, uh, to uh, do your best. And this is where improvement and, and organization and all these things come from. Very, very important. The flip side of that is we can feel unsuccessful. In spite of the many thousands of things that you do a day that are successful, you can often feel like a failure. Maybe it's because of something you do. Maybe it's because of something that you failed to do. Maybe it's something that you sinned. Uh, maybe it's just a feeling that you get because uh, of uh, the sin nature or because uh, you don't understand who you are in Jesus Christ. And here's the point. We all feel this way from time to time. I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to my wife, Kim, and just said, man, I, I feel like a failure at times. We all have that. There are things that come in our life that we feel that way. But I want you to show, I want to show you rather what God says about this, how that there is one thing that when I get my eyes on Jesus Christ, that I can say for sure that I am successful. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you even lost a marriage. Maybe you've had bad relationships. But you can say, because of Jesus Christ, because I'm in Christ, I'm successful. I'm more than a conqueror. 
Romans chapter 8, we're going to begin with verse 31. Now, I want you to notice in this passage I'm going to read today that there are a lot of rhetorical questions. And what the Apostle Paul, who wrote this, what he's trying to get us to do is to react, to apply. You see, it does no good for you to hear Scripture taught, to hear good biblical preaching, or even to read the Bible if, A, you don't understand it, or, B, you don't do what it says. You don't apply it to your life. We can read all we want. Be kind one to another. Forgive one another. But if you're not kind and you don't forgive, that verse does you no good. Okay, so Paul, right up front in this paragraph, he's saying, I want you to think about this. I want you to apply this. I want you to react to this. So he says, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to, to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened uh, with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. That's a quote from Psalm, uh, the book of Psalms, uh, verse, uh, chapter 44, verse 22, I believe it is, that it's just talking about suffering, okay, that every day the human experience, there will be suffering. That's what he's saying. So, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. All right, so notice the question. What do you think about this? How are you going to react to this? There's nothing that can separate you from God's love. Uh, no one, who matter, no matter who it is, if they condemn you, it doesn't stick because God is forgiven. He is redeemed. It doesn't matter what comes against you. No weapon is going to be formed against you that's going to prosper. And so he says, what do you think about this? Uh, even the turmoils of life, the troubles of life, they don't separate you from the love of Christ. And then he says this, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life. Now notice the pairings he does here. This is interesting. Neither death nor life, Neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing at all, creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a powerful, powerful passage of Scripture that when you begin to get it, it will transform your outlook in life. It'll transform the way you see your job, your family, your life, uh, the purpose that God has put you for. It will transform everything in your life when you see what the truths are that God has declared about you. Now, I want to just give you a few things that we need to learn from the rhetorical questions he's asked, okay? And these are declarative truths. In other words, these are true about you. If you are a believer in Christ, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, not your works, but his finished work on the cross, if you'll do that, God promised that these things are true about you. Let me just give you a few of them. Number one, God is for me. Now, when you think about that, all through life, we want people to be for us. We want people to choose us. We want people to uh, declare something good about us. We want to get the follows and the likes and, and all the stuff, right? Well, the Bible says that God is for you. I know a lot of people, they don't realize this. And I've said this many, many times. The most important thing about you is what you believe about God. If you believe that God is some uh, killjoy in the sky that's looking to persecute you and punish you on every turn. You do not understand Scripture. You do not understand who Jesus Christ is and who God the Father really is. God promised that he's for us. 
He's for you. And if he's for you, who can ever be against you? In other words, it doesn't matter who tries to come against you if God is for you. Number two, God redeemed me. This is what he is saying in this passage, that when you trust him, he redeems us. If God freely gave Jesus, his blessings are going to continue in my life. So these are powerful truths that are true when you follow Jesus Christ. God is for you. God has redeemed you. That means he has paid the price for you and you are his. And then God chose me. God chose you. This is incredible. You see, you're God's first round draft pick. I want you to think about that. God, out of all the billions of people that have ever lived, he chose you. Isn't that amazing? God chose you. You may not have been chosen for the team when you were in elementary school, okay, playing on the playground. I don't even know if they do this anymore. But when I was a kid, we'd have recess, and we'd go out and play, and I'd want to play basketball with the older boys, and they wouldn't let me play. Kind of felt bad. But God chose you. God chose you. This is incredible stuff. Now, I'm not going to get into the, uh, into the weeds about this because a lot of you don't care about this. But the fact is, there are some very powerful theological truths here about God choosing you. Some people argue that uh, God made all the choices in the past and that we don't really make any choice. I happen to believe that we have a free will, but I also believe that God is sovereign. And so I believe that God knew this in eternity past. You see, eternity... Uh, and God being eternal uh, is that he is separate from time and space. Let's consider this stand here, time and space. So anything within time and space must be linear. It's restricted to time and space, okay? But God is outside. That's how he's eternal, okay? So see, God is being outside of time and space. So rather than seeing things in a linear timeline, he sees everything at once. And that's how when Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he forgave not only the sins of the past, but the sins of the future. By the way, every one of your sins were in the future when Jesus died for them. Because he is outside of time and space. And therefore, he is able to declare that he chose you. Yes, you chose him. But I want you to understand that the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And God in his sovereignty knew that you were going to follow. He declared you to be a part of his family in eternity past. And the fact is... You have been chosen by God. Incredible. And then God justifies me. Doesn't matter who condemns me. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. And then Jesus keeps me. I love what he said there that Jesus is always pleading for us before the Father. Now, why is that? Well, if you read in the Old Testament, the Bible says that the devil, Satan, is the accuser. And he's always accusing us. And I really do believe, according to what Scripture teaches, that Jesus is there at the right hand of the Father. And every time the devil comes across and he tries to accuse you, he says, you know, you don't know that old Richie. He, man, you don't know the things he's done, the things he's failed. And Jesus is right there reminding the Father that Richie is redeemed. He is yours. You chose him. And forever and ever... I am going to have Jesus as my advocate, and you cannot get a better lawyer than that. And the fact is, God chose me. He keeps me. And that is a beautiful thing. Many of you struggle with confidence about your salvation. Because maybe there's something that you do, or you did, you made a mistake, you sinned. And you think, man, surely I'm not a Christian if I did that. But I want you to understand that God teaches us that Jesus is there making intercession for us every moment of our lives. Wow. I mean, the fact is, when I understand that, then nothing can keep me from the love of God. And then remember the question at the first, he said, what are you going to do about this? What do you think about this? How do you respond to this? Well, then he goes on to give us several examples of things that cannot overcome us. 
or separate us from the love of the Father. And, and I'll just go through them. Uh, he said pressure. Talked about trouble. That word means uh, pressure in life. You ever have pressure in life? Man, there's pressure every day. There's financial pressure. There's time constraints. There's budget pressure. There's calendar pressure. There's pressure from us from every side. But God says, oh, no, that's not going to separate you from him. Worry and stress. He talks about hardship and calamity and distress from daily living. Understand this. He says, the daily grind is not going to separate you from God. You ever just get tired you ever just get the daily grind and feel like it's just grinding you down? God says that cannot separate you from the love of God. Uh, making a living. He talks about hunger, destitution, danger, and death. So making a living. A lot of times we get so consumed with making a living that we forget to live a life. And God says we need to trust in him that it's not going to overwhelm us. And then he talks about suffering. I, I mentioned the quote from Psalm 44, verse 22. You know, there are times in life, in human lives, in all humans' lives, that we suffer. I wish it were not so. I wish I could go through life with never having suffered or never again have to suffer. But the truth is, we all suffer. There's going to be death of a loved one. There's going to be health crises in your life. There's going to be financial problems in your life. There are going to be relationship problems in your life. You say, well, Richie, I came to church to get encouraged. Thank you for just get, putting a downer on everything. No, the point is this. When you understand what Jesus is saying here, the fact is the sufferings of your life, it does not mean that God is judging you or he doesn't love you. It just means that nothing can, even suffering, cannot separate you from the love of God. And that's powerful stuff. And then he talks about death and life. Death and life. Odd combination, isn't it? Death and life cannot separate you from his love. He talks about angels and demons. Spiritual issues cannot separate you from his love. Present and future worries. Worrying about today, worrying about tomorrow. Some of you are wired that way. I don't worry as much as some people. It's just kind of my personality. I'm more positive in my outlook. But there are some people that worry if they don't have anything to worry about, right? And so he says, worries cannot defeat you. And then he goes on and says, nothing, neither height nor depth. In other words, big things or little things, things above, things below. And he says simply that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Well, as a result of all these rhetorical questions, Paul states <clears throat> that overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus. Who loved us. Other translations read it this way, we are more than conquerors. And so I can say with confidence, I am successful because I can never be separated from the love of Christ. Now that may be the world's longest inter introduction for a sermon, all right? So the sermon portion of it is going to be very, very short, okay? I want to give you three quick thoughts in about five or six minutes that will transfer, if you'll receive this today and understand what God says about you and what God has declared about you, then you can see these things and believe these things and it will change the way you live. Number one, I believe I am chosen. God chose me. I must believe it. John 15, 16, Jesus said, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. I have set you apart for work, the work of bringing in fruit. Your fruit should last. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. I am chosen. When you begin to realize that and believe that, it will change your outlook in life. Uh, number two, I believe I am complete. Complete. You see, so many of us believe the lie that we lack. I'm not suggesting that, you know, everybody can sing. All you got to do is, I, I've really never watched American Idol. I don't even know if that show's still on or not. Uh, but when it did come on, I never really watched the singing part, except for when they had the terrible singers on there that thought they were good. I know that's probably evil in my heart, but I just loved watching these guys get on there and sing, and they thought they could sing. Their mama said they could sing, but they were terrible. I'm not talking about that, Okay. Uh, 
you, you leave here today and say, well, Pastor Richie said, I am not lacking. I'm going to try out for the Atlanta Braves. Uh, you may not make it, okay? This, I'm not suggesting that there are no things that you, that there's nothing that you can't do, okay? What I'm saying is that when I am completing Christ, it changes everything in my life. Colossians 2.10, when you have Christ, you are complete. He is the head over all leaders and powers. God says that you're complete. You may feel like you lack, but God says he has given everything that you need to be able to make an influence in this life and to have a relationship with God. I am complete. And then the third thing is this. I believe I conquer through Christ. So if I understand that God has chosen me and that I am complete, then I am able and empowered to be successful in life. I am successful in following God's plan for my life. And the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, this bleeds over into every part of our life. When I rest in His grace, when I understand what He's declared about me to be true, I become a better worker. I become a better employee. When I become a better employee, I'm going to get a raise or I'm going to uh, be a part of of getting a, pro a promotion, or I'm going to be an integral part of this job. It just bleeds over into every part of my life. When I understand who I am in Christ, that I've been chosen by Him, and that I'm complete in Him, I can be more successful in my marriage. I'm a better person because of it. I am able to live by faith. I am able to live with hope. Makes me easier to be around. Makes me easier to, be, to get along with. And the fact is, it bleeds over into every part of your life, and it empowers you to be a conqueror through Christ. Let me just read a couple of scriptures and I'm done. Philippians 2.13, for God is at work within you, helping you want to obey him and then helping you do what he wants. And that is a beautiful thing. And understand that this, just like every part of the Christian life, is a process. Just because you get saved doesn't mean that you still don't have temptation in life. You're still going to be tempted to do things you shouldn't do. And you're still going to do things that you should not do. But slowly but surely, the power of the Holy Spirit in you gives you not only the ability to please God, but the desire to please God. That's beautiful, isn't it? He gives you that. Then Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Reading that in the context, Paul talked about all the suffering that he went through. And he said, I can do all things through Christ. And, and I enjoy it when Christian high school football teams have, I can do all things through Christ, and they break through it. But that's not really what the application of that is, okay? The application is that when things are good or bad, you can survive. You can be a conqueror through Christ who strengthens you. Romans 5, 17, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. You see what God was saying here is this. He wants to give you the power to reign in life. A lot of Christians don't get that. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that you go out and just say, hey, I'm going to declare that a brand new Cadillac uh, appears in my driveway. That's not what I'm saying. I, I saw a game show one time, and this person was obviously a Christian, and they kept on saying, if you will believe, you will receive, and they lost about $300,000. All right, so, um, so don't make the wrong application to this, but the point is this. God wants you to be able to reign in life. That was his original command, that you uh, subdue the earth, and reign over it. And God wants you to be able to be successful in your life, to reign in life. Then Ephesians 2.10, God has made us what we are. And in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. Well, what Paul is saying here is that you can be successful. We say this a lot at Avalon Church, success begins on Sunday. And what we're talking about is that your relationship with God is the most important part of your life. 
And when you begin to have that relationship with him, then it makes a huge difference in your life. And so what God wants us to, to know and to declare is that we're successful through him. And when I begin to understand that, it changes everything in my life. And so today, maybe you need to receive Christ as your Savior. I, I, I know this. It is the one thing that changes your life forever. And so maybe you need to pray and receive Christ. Those of you online, maybe you need to receive Christ and you're watching today. I want to encourage you. Um, say something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you right now to come into my life and to save me, to change me, and help me to live for you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that and you're joining us online, uh, click that you prayed to receive Christ there at the bottom of the screen. If you're in the room today and you need to receive Christ, I hope you will Take one of the next step cards in the seat pocket in front of you. Put your name on it and check on there that you pray to receive Christ. Drop it in the drop box on the way out because this is very, very important in your life. But what about for thus those that have already been saved? How do we apply this today? Just like Paul said, what do you think about this? Well, I want to encourage you this week to begin to, begin to go through the notes we have these notes on the Bible app. You can look at them during the week. But remind yourself of what God has declared about you. When you begin to feel like you're not going to make it, when you begin to feel like you're going to fail, you need to pray and you need to trust God. And remember these things that God has declared to be true about you. And so that's my challenge for you today, that you will remember these things and pray about these things during the week. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for everything that you have done for us. Thank you for declaring us to be redeemed and to be justified and to be righteous because of Jesus. Thank you that you said we are more than conquerors. And God, I pray that you'd empower our people, Lord, with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to live for you, to be able to make a difference in their family, in their job, at their school, in their neighborhood. God, I pray that you'd empower them to live out your purpose. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.